All right, welcome to A Growing Concern. As I posted on the website earlier, uh, we're going to talk tonight about the white nationalist organizing in town here and free speech rights. Uh, there's a lot of sub-themes going on. We have folks here that can talk about it. We have Gregory Robert McKelvey, Portland Resistance, here on my, my right. And on the far right, we have Randy Blaylock. Blazak. <laughs> I get that okay. wrong every time. Okay. Uh, Randy Blazak, Coalition Against Hate Crimes. Right. So there's a lot to talk about, but I thought before we get into the, the meat of the matter, there's so much going on now with the, with the, the murders of the two people on the, and the almost, almost three murders on the train that day. But first, a little bit about what you've been doing. You said you've been doing this kind of work for 30 years. Yeah, it's hard to imagine. Sounds like I started, you could be that old. I, I, well, you know, I, I, in a way I've been doing it most of my life because I grew up in a little town in Georgia called Stone Mountain which is sort of famous to a lot of folks. It's in Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech, which I didn't realize it was there until I went off to college and, and found out he name-checked my little hometown because it's the birthplace of the modern Klan. So I grew up around the Ku Klux Klan oh boy. and thinking that that was normal. Southern Poverty <laughs> Law Center and all that. Or... Well, yeah, th I don't even think they were there at that point. So I, um, so it was when I went off to college and, and uh, got a loan on a clue, as I like to say that I started to get sort of a different picture of what those people were all about and a, and a counter argument. And so I started trying to unpack my own upbringing in a clan town and working on, on that issue and understanding it. So when I was a, while I was a graduate student, my work was, um, was what we call ethnographic research, which is really field research studying white supremacists in, in the late 1980s and in the 1990s, which at that point were really dominated by the racist skinhead movement. So I spent years hanging out with skinheads, you know, in, in both the United States and Europe. Um, undercover or just? Yeah, undercover. Oh, boy. Undercover. So one of the reasons <laughs> I moved to Portland when I finished all that, all that, my doctoral dissertation was I sort of had to get the hell out of town. Because I, I was, you know, the worst offender, which was a race trader. Um, and that was in the days before the Internet made it easy to find you. This is 1995. So, um, so they, they know me well now. But, um, but so I've been doing that work ever since. And... Uh, really tr following these groups in the prison and looking at the growth of prison groups like in Oregon where we have European kindred. We had a, a pretty Mary. horrific hate crime last August where an EK member ran down an African-American teenager in Gresham and killed him. Um, and, and keeping track of the movement, for lack of a better word. I mean, we really don't like to call it a movement because it's not moving anywhere. It's not very well organized. It's more of a counterculture. But kind of keeping track of the evolution. And of course, you know, this is a period when the internet is really transforming the whole thing. So, I mean, I, you know, I joke about the Klan rallies I used to go to for my research. Uh, and you don't really have to have a Klan rally or even a skinhead meeting anymore. It's all happening in virtual. It's all websites. Virtual uh, reali virtual reality on, music on the internet. So, so the work I do now, I mean, I'm, I've been the chair of the Oregon Coalition Against Hate Crime since 2002. It's a statewide organization that was founded in 1997 to both monitor the issue of hate, uh, to respond to communities and victims of hate, to work partnering with law enforcement when they need help solving hate crimes and to do education around the issue of hate. Uh, and so we've been, pretty, we've been pretty active in the last year, as you can imagine, with the Trump election. That whole thing brought, really kind of kicked the, dusted the cobwebs off the coalition and brought everybody back to the table. Mm -hmm. So yeah, pretty active. And through all that time, you were teaching there at? Yeah, I was at Portland State for 20 years. I'm teaching at U of O now and uh, trying to help students. You know, when, I, when I'm teaching this stuff, we, people are always interested in, let's talk about the Nazis, let's talk about the guys in clan hoods. But I always try to turn around, back around on us. Even if I'm going out and talking to high school kids, they want to know about the extremists. But then I say, well, let's talk about the language of hate that we use, you know, using retard as a put down or saying that's so gay or, or even the things that we don't recognize as, as hate speech. So it's always about them to, as a lure to bring people into a conversation about us, mm. and I include myself in that process. Yeah. We're all kind of they, recovering. They must realize it's systemic. It isn't something that's well. That's the thing. It's, it's cultural because it's in the way we speak. The way we speak about women, we're still embedded in all kinds of, besides white supremacy of, of, of sexism and, and misogyny, uh, but it's also in the institutions. So we, we can at least work on it on ourselves, mm. uh, and then figure out how to change it within institutions. Sure. Well, Gregory, uh, he uh, 
He covered a lot of ground there. <laughs> yeah, he did. Yeah, sorry. This is nah, the professor nothing. in me just starts, no. goes into lecture mode. It's so good. I'll, I just got out of school, so I can, I can, I can <laughs> listen to a lecture. I'll try to dial it back a little bit. <laughs> well, you graduated. Uh, you didn't go to the bar yet, but you got the... Yeah, I graduated from law school, law school. This, this past Saturday. So. Oh, oh wow. that's awesome. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that's it. Amazing. I've seen it on uh, Facebook there. And yeah, yeah I don't little, recommend it. <laughs> but, uh, law school? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I had a friend. In fact, he used to have this slot before I took it over on uh -oh. TV. He went up north, and uh, uh, Paul Richmond, and he uh, he became a lawyer, and, and he's he's doing a lot of environmental and, and uh, I think uh, things that uh, when when people need a good lawyer, but you know they don't have a ton of money, he's helping them out. That's important work. So, yeah. yeah, it is, especially because uh, Lewis and Clark puts out a lot of environmental law. Yeah, I don't they know do. What it's, yours it's, was. it's one of the best environmental law. Um, programs in the, in the country. Mm -hmm. Is that what you graduated from? No, I, I just was a general law student, but um, if I ever did practice law, I would probably do criminal defense. So. Mm -hmm. Well, you got, you got, well, you first got notoriety, at least people knew about you when you, you come out of the don't shoot, don't shoot Portland. Yeah, I was, I was once uh, working with don't shoot Portland. With folks, and then uh, you got your own Portland resistance now. Correct. And uh, is Portland resistance involved in well, it's not a really way to good say it because <laughs> i know you are uh with what's going on like randy was talking about here in town with the, with the white racist organizing and all that yeah and uh what what how are you folks responding to this well we've been involved in a lot of the counter rallies there was a, a rally by the same folks that are throwing this one at, um in vancouver and salem and lake oswego and we were involved in a lot of those counter rallies that you know sometimes there would be pockets of violence but um, for this specific one, we're not in, um, very involved in a lot of the counter protests because um, we don't want to act as if we are telling people you have to be there um, because if somebody got hurt, we wouldn't want to be involved. But at the last rally that Jeremy Christian showed up at, actually, the person who committed those two murders, um, we had yeah we had our uh, security team there and um, and a lot of Portland's resistance people there um, that w witnessed uh, him show up and start shouting at people and, and um, shouting people down and such. The right wing folks even uh, uh, just distanced themselves from him and booted him out of the, well, the tennis court. There they they said that he's not specifically with us. Had he not come up saying those specific things. There's people inside of that crowd that hold those same sentiments that weren't as unhinged to be yelling them, but um, they agree completely with those things. There are people in those rallies that say similar stuff, but not as loud, um, that don't run up saying that stuff. Uh, it was a good opportunity for them to say, we're distancing ourselves from them, but we have to think about why did he feel as though he would be welcome there? And I think that's the more important mm -hmm. point. That goes into one of the main points that I wanted to bring out tonight, maybe not this soon, but the fact that the because uh, I have a clip of the, the, the speaker from that from from that particular rally and they're, they're able they're able to tuck themselves in now and uh, and point to the other side that they're infringing on their on their free speech rights. And so they're not they're making it away from racism. They're making it away from what they're really all about and able to point to the other side. And, well. and, and they're using that as a recruiting tool. Well, free speech, um, our free speech clause, as well as the, the entire Bill of Rights has to do with what the government can't take away from you, what the government cannot do. Um, there's no right to not be protested. There's no right to not have blow horns that are going on while you're speaking your hate speech. It has to do with what the government allows you to do. So if a person doesn't uh, allow you to be heard in the same way that you would be if there was nobody there, that's not what the First Amendment is about. Um, but if they are all about their First Amendment rights, then why did they kick out Jeremy Christian um, or claim that they were kicking him out for yelling uh, similar things in what they said? Mm -hmm. Good point. That's a good I thought point. So you were nodding there yeah. too. So we were discussing this before before uh, Gregory showed up. And uh, what what is your view on that? Well, I mean, the First Amendment is sacred, and you're right. It's about what the government can do to to stop or or limit a First Amendment. So I mean, I, I mean, let's be serious. These guys are using the First Amendment as a shield to come out and say things that are protected but extremely bigoted and uh, on multiple levels especially islamophobic and xenophobic and racist i mean they're just using that as 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 a nice little umbrella to, to protect themselves as an excuse like it's okay to say these things because they're just expressing their first amendment and of course everybody else has the first amendment right to uh, offer their opinion about these folks and so that's you know that's the position of the counter demonstrators but it's it's a clever little dog and pony show. I mean, they're using sort of the smoke and mirrors of the First Amendment to 
to mask what the real agenda is. And the real agenda is deeply connected to some of these issues that have been a part of Oregon's troubled history since its founding and even before. So, I mean, it's almost comical to see themselves as these defenders of the First Amendment, but it's also very clever because when they're attacked or shouted down by other people who are also expressing their First Amendment, then they come off as these victims. You know, we have a right to say these things, and you know, we're, we're the underdog here, and liberal Portland is oppressing our First Amendment right, and so they martyr themselves around this staged, um, staged conflict that's not real. You know, everybody's expressing their First Amendment rights in the police, and the mayor should be said, uh, whether he wants to or not, can't can't stop it. So it's it's. We've seen this over the years with the with the more formal white supremacist movement, how they try to like change their public image. David Duke was famous for saying, you know, let's take off the hoods and put on Brooks Brothers suits. Right. He even got they a did. <laughs> he even got a nose job so he would look more Aryan, which is just sort of an extreme manifestation wow. <laughs> of the, the the makeover of white supremacists. So that you know, and there and I have to be clear, all, there are people in the alt right movement who are not avowed white supremacists. But it seems, like you say, it seems to attract those people. Their rhetoric, their mm -hmm. you know, anti-immigrant, protectionist, nationalist stuff. It's just kind of a nice um, covering. But um, so it just, I mean, I, again, I don't want to go into lecture mode. But there, there's a parallel with the militia movement in the 1990s with the, that Timothy McVeigh came out of. On the on the surface, most of the people that were brought into the militia movement were there for Second Amendment rights and land use and hating paying their taxes. I mean, those are sort of mainstream like, issues. Like Jefferson that, Republic and Southern yeah, Oregon. That, that <laughs> don't have any race or religion. But you go a little bit further down in that, and then it becomes a sort of hatred of the federal government. And then you go a little bit farther down in that, and it's a, a conspiracy theory that the federal government is controlled by the, by the Bilderbergs and by the Freemasons. And you go a little bit further down in it, and it's the conspiracy theories of the Jews. It's this old anti-Zionist mm -hmm. you know, conspiracy. And you go down a little bit farther at the bottom of that funnel, you get the people that believe there needs to be a violent revolution. And that's where Timothy McVeigh was. So the more people you bring at the top, the more people you funnel down the bottom. And I think with the alt-right movement, and it, it's all its manifestations and weirdness from Breitbart down to you know, Milo and all these other people that are, that are representing it, at the surface, it can be about something as... as as innocuous as free speech, mm -hmm. or you know our immigration issues, or let's have economic protectionism, you know those things. But as you go down, it becomes much more insidious. And I think Jeremy Christian is the Timothy. He idolized Timothy McVeigh. He posted pro Timothy McVeigh things on his Facebook. So he's a perfect example. Is as you go farther down this movement, it gets much more frightening and much more violent. True. That's my mini lecture <laughs> on it. And well, in you a know, few it, uh, I think you had uh, Gregory. Burning the midnight oil there. I got seen you. You were over there well, I, going you know, over I, what well, he was I saying. I think you can go further. I mean, I, th I think you could generalize it slightly more than these layers that we've put it at. Um, what we have is a, a white class that is not upper class that doesn't want to be the bottom of the barrel. And that's the, the catalyst for the Klan. It's the catalyst for these movements in the 90s where we are not at this top echelon of, of society that we view that has been our mandate. We view whiteness and Americanism as the same thing. Um, and if we are not there, there's somebody to blame. Um, and we want to blame the people that are trying to rise up above us. You need to be kicked back down there um, so that we can, can be here and we can be one step away from being a Donald Trump. Trump. Um, we're, we're one job away from, from being the top class um, in the upper echelon of society. Um, but you don't have to be a, a self-avowed white supremacist to perpetuate the rise and uh, the, the um, grasp of white supremacy on our society. And so I don't think it makes a difference whether you show up and say you have support of the Nazis or white supremacy if you hold the same ideals as them. Um, and, and while I do agree that everybody has a First Amendment right to say these things, and um, I think Jeremy Christian had the First Amendment right to run up on that rally and yell the things that he did, but if I pr promote a rally as, uh, and I name the event, Come Beat Up the People of Portland, um, and then I promote it as a place where you bring your guns, where you can uh, shoot people that disagree with you, where we're going to take a stand and fight liberals in, in the streets of Portland. I won't get a permit. If I change the name to a free speech event 
and promote it exactly the same, now the ACLU will defend me and, uh, and I suddenly have these First Amendment rights. So the First Amendment doesn't only look at the name and the title of the event, but it looks at what you're doing. The, the famous example is you don't have the right to yell fire in a, in a crowded theater. I would argue that the the rally that's coming up here on the 4th, they're not saying we're going to yell f uh, fire in a crowded theater, but we're making an event that says come light a fire in a crowded theater. And I don't think it's as cut and dry uh, of a First Amendment right as, you know, the ACLU might have uh, made it out to be. And I think that us at Portland Resistance has done, have done a lot of research on how they are promoting these, this event, who they are inviting to come, um, Baked Alaska, Bay Stick Man. These are people that are only known for violence. And everybody who's promoting this event is promoting it as an opportunity to come beat up the people of Portland because they disagree with them. So, um, you know, maybe they have a First Amendment to say those things, but I think it's more nuanced in the cut and dry um, uh, that this is just speech and hate, even hate speech is uh, protected. And I also think that on May Day, we saw um, police yank a permit because of a fabricated story of a Molotov cocktail, which as we, as we go forward, we know that there was no Molotov cocktails thrown. Maybe there was some sort of vandalism or violence. But if they're, cans, sure, yeah. but if they're yeah. gonna yank a permit over that, I hope they yank a permit from these alt-right people for um, showing up with their guns and, and, and drawing them or whatever they might do that uh, I would argue is far more uh, egregious and not covered by the First Amendment than maybe throwing a Pepsi can. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what, what uh, Randall, Randy was saying also, I thought that there's a lot of it, and you were speaking about these different levels, and it was I was thinking about it earlier, you know, on the top you've got your xenophobic and your, your uh, white supremacist, and you've got your separatists who say we got nothing against people of color, but we just think we should be separate from them. And then we have this whole range underneath that, and uh, people think that if they're down here, they don't necessarily you know, have have that sin load or whatever on their conscience. And well, I have to say, I, I, I mean, true. it is a broad counterculture. I mean, there are all kinds of folks in it, including sometimes people of color who are members of yeah. these groups. <laughs> but every person that says they're a, a, a white separatist is a white supremacist. It's there. I mean, they're lying straight to your to face if they say they're not. Too, Why do you want to be separate? It's because we're, we're different, we're better. So, I mean, I, it, it's the kind of gentler. Again, this is sort of the rebranding that happens. So mm -hmm. I, I have to have a little chuckle about when people say that they're separatists. And, and of course, um, the Northwest has been a home for these folks. There's been, an, besides Oregon's long history, and we can get into you know our history that is steeped in, in, in racism, um, there's been this belief of the Northwest imperative that, especially in the in 80s and the 90s, a lot of groups like Aryan Nations believed that they could stake out the Northwest and make it their white-only homeland. And now it goes under the name of the Cascadia Alliance, uh, which is sort of this online campaign to make the Northwest the white-only homeland. And I've talked to these people, and I said, how are you going to do that? Because I'm not planning on moving. I don't think you want to move. So, you know, the only way they do that is through violence and purging and, you know, they, they will use. I, I had this conversation mm -hmm. with a, a member of a, of a very notorious skinhead gang here in town that's no longer uh, formally organizing. And I said, how can you do that? You can never do it. The federal government's going to have something 